Today we will be talking about Sunny Gavikar's second poem, With Love, in the last, last first poem, uh, Naked Love. I am Arshit Nanda, Assistant Professor at Keshav Mahavidyalay, University of Delhi. So first we will begin with a reading of the poem and after reading the poem we will unpack the various metaphors, images and ideas that are packed in this poem. So the poem is With Love. Mercy dear, do not flatter black as seven charms and might of tempest. When blacks are being hacked, humiliated, hounded out, despite songs of praise and from poets and time, mercy dear, do not flatter black as seven charms and might of tempest. Do not say without knowing that the mighty who have left horse-borne power and taken captives will ever return. When the fisherman prophesizes a sunken ship, do not speak without knowing of the warm eaten nectar in the womb of the sea. Do not speak without knowing my father absent ever from dinner and my mother breeding without thought. Do not say anything without knowing the feet that uncovered your deferred youth. Do not say without knowing first hand that black is this breeze, car saying lovingly and my love a bad counter. Mercy, dear. Do not say anything without knowing of the blood falling on the ground when my black sister, tired of puffing at the fire, pines as a lover and turns into dust as mother. Well, let's first begin with the irony of the title itself. The title of the poem is With Love and it is addressed in the form of a letter to a person named Mercy. The title seems like a letter addressed to a person named Mercy and it's signed off as With Love. Like we'll sign off letters at the bottom, we write with love as a salutation. That's exactly the title of the poem. So a kind of an, uh, a long monologue addressed or a letter form addressed to mercy. However, while the poem uses the conventional form of address, it is not a poem about love. Even though it, the title is with love, it is a poem that primarily is anti-romantic. It is essentially an anti-romantic poem that seeks to question the romanticization of Dalit lives as well as the denial of love that they experience in their everyday lives. The poem at the beginning, in the very premise, questions the songs, the myths and the folklore associated with the fisherman community and with the larger Dalit community that glorifies and in a way presents them in glorious light. So, uh, let's just look at the first paragraph of the poem. Mercy, dear, do not flatter black as seven charms and might of tempest. In the traditional folklore, you know, the Dalit community is presented as, especially the localized fisher community that uh, Kavikar is talking about, is presented as possessing charms as well as the power of the tempest. So they have certain kinds of uh, supernatural powers and they possess the resilience and the might of a tempest. And the core of Sunny Kavikar's poem is to cry against this kind of imagery. He begins by saying, do not flatter black. The core of the poem is a cry against the word flattery. A flattery is a form of excessive praise that is embodied in the myth, songs and folklore of these people. So the poet addresses mercy not to flatter people, to tell them realistically what their lives are rather than glorifying it and presenting them as heroic figures. The songs and tales mythologize the community as the possessor of great charms and the power of a mighty tempest. It is this mythological representation and supernatural image that the poet seeks to break up by emphasizing the natural and the realistic uh, description of their lives, by telling us how they live their lives in everyday environment rather than the tales of heroism that are associated with the community. It is a plea, the entire poem is a plea against romanticizing their hard existence. So, you know, if the first stanza of the poem offers a, 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 a beginning where a poet asks you to negate, to do not flatter black. So the first point stanza tells you to negate the experience, to negate the kind of mythology that is associated with the community. Whereas the second stanza offers a counter description of the community, a counter description of how their ordinary everyday lives are. When blacks are being hacked, 
humiliated, hounded out, despite songs of praise from poets and time. The word black in turn acquires multiple connotations in this poem, especially in this stanza. In the first stanza, the black is written with a small b and is linked with seven charms and the power of the tempest uh, that are, uh, you know, that, that are described in the folklore of the community. Whereas in the second stanza, black appears with the capital letter and describes the real condition of the people. While the first stanza urges mercy not to flatter people with heroic songs, the second stanza describes the realistic conditions of black as they do not have the might of tempest or seven charms, but in reality are hacked, humiliated and hounded out by powerful people. And even if though we have been singing these songs of praise, these glorified images of people for a long time, it has not changed their actual condition. And even after songs of praise that have been sung in the community over time, condition of depravity, subservience and pain has not altered over time. So the poet urges us to look at the condition as it is, to describe it realistically, to not revel in mythological creations of our own mind, look at reality and present it as it is. And this is the reality of the Blacks. They're being hacked, humiliated and hounded. In other words, while the first stanza challenges the romanticization of their life, the second stanza offers a counter description of pain and suffering that characterizes their existence. So this is what the poem is doing in the first two stanzas. The first challenges the mythological representation, whereas the other offers a counter description, which is based and rooted in realism. So, the entire poem works with an idea of negation. It is at the core of the poem. In the rest of the stanzas, all the stanzas that follow uh, the second stanza work with the idea of negation. As the poet negates the authority of the folk song and the tales to describe the lives of the Dalit community. Therefore, the, each stanza in the poem follows a constant refrain, do not speak without knowing. Do not speak without knowing. It's a phrase that appears multiple times within the poem. The songs and folk stories have spoken about the Dalit experience without knowing and without, in a way, confronting its true reality. They have tried to shy away from the true reality to romanticize their existence. And the point wants to negate the superficial, superficial description of mythical tales and replace it with the reality of their experiences. The poem marks a shift from the collective myth mythical consciousness embodied in songs and folklore to a much more realistic description of individual struggles that they have to face in their everyday lives. So this negation of their uh, everyday existence is what the poet sees in, the, uh, in their folklore. And in, he in turn negates that folklore and constantly you know, emphasizes the importance of knowledge and experience. So this idea of to know personally what has an individual or a community has experienced is essential to be able to write about them, to be able to narrate and describe their experience. So the poet continues, do not speak without knowing my father absent ever from dinner and my mother breeding without thought. In the last lecture, we had spoken about the immense importance of realism in Dalit literature and its narrative stories and poems. The idea of realism was to ensure that Dalit individuals inform and write their own stories and that their stories are neither hijacked by supernatural myths and narratives nor by the descriptive accounts offered by upper caste individuals. Instead, the core of Dalit narrative or Dalit literature was uh, an individual who personally experiences the hardships of their own, you know, lived uh, identity and in a way later narrativizes it in the form of an autobiography or a poem or a short story or a novel. But personal experience was at the core of this form of writing. And therefore, the poet here says, do not speak without knowing my father. Do not speak without, and it's not the father that's not known but do not speak without the actual knowledge of what the community goes through. Do not blabber without experiencing what happens really here. And the rest of the poem is a series of images 
that are experienced by the poet specifically, but are uh, can be replicated uh, in the Dalit experience. And the poet wants us to know them personally before we engage with them intellectually or aesthetically. So the, uh, the idea of realism here gains importance over the idea of uh, fan fantasy creation and world building in the mind. And in that sense, it, it seems that poet is reminding mercy to speak with and through her experience. To not speak of fantasy tales, but to speak with and her experience of what it means to be a Dalit person, a Dalit woman. And this experience is what lies at the heart of uh, their realism. So in the next few stanzas, the poet creates a collage of realistic images that attempt to challenge and break the shackles of mysticism and glory that have been built through folklore and tales. We will look at each of these images individually and try to unpack what the poet is trying to say. Do not speak without knowing my father absent ever from dinner and my mother breeding without thought. The first image is that of a constantly absent father and a mother who is constantly giving birth to more and more children. While the father refuses to take up the responsibility of the household, he is still in some ways engaging in uh, sexual promiscuity with the mother, and which leads to innumerable children. And there is, at the core of what uh, this image embodies, is an image of a broken household. It is an image of a broken household that is surviving at the margins of the society. This is what the Dalit experiences. Not mighty tempest, not seven charms, but people struggling to survive at the margins of the society. In the next stanza, it goes on. Do not say anything without knowing the street that uncovered your deferred youth. In the next stanza, the poet directly addresses mercy and claims that you should not say anything without knowing, and in this case, without remembering the streets that deferred your youth. She, in some ways, it seems, at least it's hinted in the stanza, could not blossom into a young woman because of the harrowing experiences of her life. And her tale should be a reflection of her own experience rather than extravagant, uh, you know, narratives that revel in fantastical achievements of the community. So he's saying, do not talk about big things. Just come to your own experience and tell us. Do not speak about other things. Tell us about your own life and how your youth was denied to you and how the streets denied your youth. And this pattern continues uh, in the next few stanzas also. But it acquires a unifying pattern, a unifying uh, theme in the next three stanzas and we will look at them. And this unifying theme is about deferred youth and denied love. All the three, there are three characters that appear in three different standards and they've all denied their youth and denied love in their life. So let us, uh, the first we have spoken about mercy, but let's just look at these three standards together and then we can focus on each one of them. The last three standards of the poem deal with a singular theme in the lives of the three individuals, mercy, poet and the poet's sister. These are the three characters that appear in the last three stanzas, mercy, poet, and the poet's sister. The conditions of depravity and destitution have ensured that these individuals have been denied both youth and love in their lives. We looked at mercy's uh, stanza. Do not say anything without knowing the street that uncovered your deferred youth. Mercy has been denied her years of youth. In the words of poem, her youth has been indefinitely deferred. So she doesn't know when she will get to experience that youth. Perhaps never. The second is about the poet himself. The poetic voice says, speaks about himself. Do not say without knowing first hand that black is this breeze casting lovingly and my love a bad counter. The poetic persona has been transformed by the black breeze in a way that there is no possibility of love. The black breeze might refer to the condition of the poet's existence. The poet described, so you know, we, we have constantly encountered the word black 
not only in this poem but in the previous poem of Sunny Kabikar. Here, the black refers to the black breeze is refers to the social economic conditions that have stifled the life of the poet, that have in in a way you know strangulated him uh, and into his tiny existence. And this black breeze that is casting him lovingly and does not allow him to experience the possibilities of love. The poet describes his love as a bad counter, which emphasizes that no transaction of love is possible over this bad counter. You know, it's like a materialistic image of, uh, of you know, a shopkeeper sitting at a counter and there is someone who comes to buy certain things. It is in that image. It's a the bad counter is a materialistic metaphor used to describe his existential angst, where he is denied the possibility of love, because the 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 stifling of you know the the angst that is comes to existence is so stifling, and the struggle of survival is so deep that you cannot experience either the beauty of young youth or the or the you know, wonderfulness of love. Both of these are denied to Mercy, the poet, and even the poet's sister. And it is in the last stanza that we come and encounter the poet's sister. Mercy, dear, do not say anything without knowing of the blood falling on the ground when my sister, tired of puffing at the fire, pines as a lover and turns into dust as a mother. So finally, the poet narrates the story of his sister who is at an age when she should be pining as a lover, but she has been reduced to dust. Her identity has ensured that she has to leave behind her flowering youth and her, uh, and her identity as a lover to transform into a mother who has to carry the burden of household responsibility. So at an age, finally, the poet narrates the story of her sister who is at an age when she should be, you know, a woman blossoming into youth, a woman who is encountering love, who is pining as a lover. But what has she been reduced to? Her material conditions have reduced her to a mother. She is now like a dust, uh, you know, puffing at the fire. You know, in traditional households, when if you do not have gas, you're constantly puffing at the fire to let it blow. And that also means seeking in and soaking in a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of uh, you know, bad air that messes up with your body. It is now she lies like there, puffing at the fire. And at this age, she should be pining as lover, but she has been turned into dust, just like her mother. So, which in turn reminds us about the earlier stanza in the poem where the mother was breeding constantly, whereas the father was absent. And in a uh, almost a very similar image, the sister of the poet becomes like his mother in a way because she is also denied her youth, denied her agency, denied love, denied, um, you know, her youth and she becomes like her mother, breeding constantly and bearing the unbearable burdens of household responsibility. It is the denial of youth and love that the poet wants mercy to remember when she speaks about the people and the community. So when Mercy actually engages in this, uh, is engaging in a discourse about the community, he wants her to be realistic. He wants her to speak about what has been experienced by her, him and his sister, rather than tales of mythological creatures and mighty tempests and charms. So this is how the poem comes to a certain end. Now let us look at the 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 title of the poem i began with the title of the poem after closely analyzing the poem as we have done it becomes even more evident why with love is an ironic title for the poem the poem is about how the conditions of life have ensured that love is denied to people from the poet's community that love is denied to people from the dalit community in no alphabet in sight, Kani Kavikar, the Sunny Kavikar, the poet of this uh, poem, says, is quoted as saying, What Dalit want is a new life, not merely recognition of what they are, 
This is also why love and the sexual experience are central to his poetry. Today, he says, the sexual life of Dalit is in the hands of the capitalists to aspire for a new humanity, a human stature. They need to reclaim love and sex. So, uh, the in the introduction, the writers make it clear that Sunny Kavikar's poem are in some ways deal with the idea of love and sexuality. And with love is an example. It's a poem that does not deal with uh, love as well as the condition where love is denied. In this poem, the emotional love life of Dalit is controlled by factors in the social world. As the poet says in that quote, that the love life of Dalits is in the hands of capitalists. Similarly, in this poem, the love life is controlled by social world, by the conditions of economic, social, financial conditions of the people, and it is not in their hands. They're not able to live their youth to the fullest, to fall in love. Uh, with people. They are denied the autonomy of engaging in love and that is what lies at the center of the poem. In a way, uh, the title of the poem becomes a metaphor for, a, you know, not with love but something that where love is denied. But there is one thing that is also being, lies hidden, almost like a hidden message in the poem. In a way, the title might also point towards the way in which po the poet is able to transcend this condition of denial as he addresses mercy with love. Now, finally, after describing the condition within which he, his sister and mercy have lived and in which his mother also lived, he titles the poem as with love. Perhaps the poem in itself, in its address, is the beginning of a new uh, prospect, a new condition where he will be able to revel in love, where he'll be able to be uh, in love or with love, uh, with mercy, fall in love with mercy. And perhaps that is what the poem indicates at the end. So this is Sunny Kavikar's With Love. I'll just take over the points that we have covered in today's lecture. In this poem, the poet discards the supernatural tendencies prevalent in Dalit literature that celebrate seven charms and fantasy-like folklore of Dalit community. Instead, he offers the realistic description of his community and the members of that community through images of pain and suffering. The poem marks an aesthetic shift from the glorification of the Dalit community to a realistic description of their ordinary lives. An ordinary life that have, that have immense dif difficulty. Uh, finally, the poem concludes with three images of how love and youth has been denied to individuals from the Dalit community. And the three images are that of the poet, the poet's sister, and Mercy, the woman who is being addressed in the poem. So the this lecture referred to two primary readings. One was the introduction to No Alphabet Inside, New Dalit Writings from South India, by edited by Susi Tharu and K. Satyendra And for Mod Naya's essay, Dalit Poetry and the Aesthetics of uh, Traumatic Materialism. Thank you and I will see you in the next lecture.